best instruments money can buy. But probably the finest maker around now. It's got all the extra keys as well. Yeah. And there you're looking 200 quid. So. Nice to see you. Nice to see you again. Nice tricks. <laughs> This solves my problem at the moment. Oh, I not uh, the G one. It used to be great here in the Ulster Hall. You wouldn't have got a seat in the Ulster Hall with a senior flute was playing. Senior flute always played on Friday night. And you wouldn't have got a seat. I don't go on Mamma going on there and playing at Carson's and the intermediate section. Quarter to three in the morning and going home in our top of a road sweeper. Mr. Judy Taylor, ladies and gentlemen, we're now ready to commence World Championship Flute. Test piece, the Turk in Italy overture. There are nine competitors, fan number one, now ready to play. There has always been a, a, a great tradition of flute playing in, in Northern Ireland. I think now that probably it has expanded because of the exposure of, of, of James Galway. Possibly the cost of the instrument. A student model is, is, is not terribly expensive. Also possibly, I have to say, it's not a difficult instrument on which to start. I must say that really, I mean, there are two types of flute bands in, in Northern Ireland. There's the marching band, uh, quite often just melody flutes. And then there are the, the senior bands, um, some of them still march, but not as much as they used to. And they, I would class more as concert bands. Um, they do lots of, of, of concerts and competitions. Sunday. I brought Roy Newsom over to adjudicate. Banger School Bomb was playing on there. Uh, Jim Birch had them. I had a car bomb off here at the back of the Ulster Hall. I thought Roy Newsom would have been around home. <laughs> but maybe I've kept going, like, you know, and uh, the association's not sectarian, non political. I'm in the Shanghai Road Defenders because I like both being a partisan band and I like playing the flute. I like marching. It's just to get out there and play, you understand? And everybody in the road knows, knows the band. You can see them coming up from the bottom of the Shanghai Road. They say, here's the Shanghai Road Defenders. There's a new way to play in their appearance. You can, the Blood and Thunder band, you get guys there, they won't even tune their flutes, you know, and they don't play in unison, where we do. The trouble started, we, we were rendering contests in the Ulster Hall. And when they started, then everything just dropped away. It didn't bother him. But uh, the bonus kept the gear through all the troubles, like. There's 
a lot of young members in the band now. That's what I say. I keep saying every year I'm going to retire. But I couldn't stand and watch a band get down the road. It's just too hurting, you know. I've never had any rise from my father in the band, you know. When my son's old, old enough to play a flute, he will be playing it, you know. And I hope that if he ever has a family, that his son will take my place. I don't think girls are suitable for bands, you know. And I don't think the Shingle Defenders will ever have a girl in the band. Because if a girl comes in, I'll be going out. Well, the bands themselves are not exclusively uh, male. I mean, there are girl accordion bands, but instantly enough, you tend to have a sort of sexual division of musical labour between those uh, girls who, by and large, play the accordions and the uh, lads who, by and large, play the flutes. I uh, say, I say, a Freudian psychologist, psychoanalyst might have some comment to make on the uh, significance of the flute uh, within the male psyche, but. Uh, it certainly is the case, if you look at the north of Ireland, that's very, very rare to see a girl playing a flute in a Blood and Thunder band. And indeed, when I questioned the young people, they thought it wasn't at all appropriate and said it wouldn't be a military looking enough, it wouldn't be macho enough, really. I must admit, I liked the flute. I always thought it was a feminine sort of instrument. I think the flute could be any type of instrument you want. It could be a happy or sad, feminine, masculine type of instrument. I certainly enjoyed walking with the band. Uh, for instance, um, the feeling that not only a female would get, but I think a male would get as well, walking down a road playing a flute. Um, I don't think that that really matters. I think everybody feels the same. Getting the commitment of 20, 30 or 40 players sometimes can be very difficult and it can limit an enthusiastic player within that to what he does because of being he had to be relied on other people. But in Flotilla with being five people we're usually pretty sure that we can can do a wee bit more than what a wee bit more work to than a flute band can. for almost five years. Um, our flute playing, I think it is, I think it has deepened. I don't mean it has got particularly better. Um, I would say that we maybe understand one another a lot better now when it comes down to music. We do share a lot of ideas on a band if we're in or, or some sort of a musical venture that we're getting into and we would decide together that um, we would say well what about giving such and such a go yeah and we would do it. restricted to any type of music at all. We play classics, pop, uh, folk, anything really. I'm the person who's responsible usually for doing the arrangements, so if I think it could work then I would chance it and see what happens. Underneath it all, we're both exactly the same. We both share the exact same views and we both want the same. I think we're uh, fanatics. I think it's the only way to be. I was fascinated to know why it was that the flute bands uh, uh, seemed to be so popular, obviously, in the rest of the Western world. Young people spend their time listening to rock music, uh, wanting to join rock bands, wanting to basically get involved um, in various types of pop music. Why is it in the north of Ireland is this ongoing, enduring tradition? Uh, and that seemed to me very interesting. And indeed, when I did a survey of young people in the Londonderry area, young Protestants, it became very obvious 
that, I mean, it was a very widespread uh, activity. One in six of the young people were in bands uh, in the secondary schools, and over half the young people were active supporters and attended parades at various times. So it was this clearly a very important social phenomenon in the life of these young people. And the question was, why was it really in the 1980s the young people were, young teenagers were interested in flute bands? Uh, so that led me on to really ask questions partly about how the political role these had in the lives of young people, and then secondly, how they performed various recreation functions, provide a focus for young people who don't have much money in their pockets for a recreational life that's probably denied to them um, in terms of access to dance halls and commercial forms of leisure these days. About the house, we didn't have a television in the house as such, you know, maybe there was one in another room, but I would come in at night, you know, when they did get a bit bigger, you know, uh, I'd come in at night and maybe be playing the tune, or, or, or maybe Tara would be playing the tune, and then you'd lift the tune and you'd flute and you'd play, and maybe Kieran would come in and he'd lift the fiddle, and Tara would come in, before you go out, you'd have a whole session going, and Arvel would say, that's terrible. Come on and get your dinner. That's terrible music. That you know, it maybe just didn't hit. Another night would come in and it would just hit off, and Avril would say, "That's lovely. Never mind about the dinner. You know, just that, that's the way it would happen." There's one, one of the great things I, I like about for for by the crack of the music and everything. The names they fascinate me. You know, at times and. Where they come from, I don't know. Ach, there's names, is, names, is some beautiful names. It's one sort of modern tune now they play. It's, it's not a beautiful name, it's an odd name. The Floating Crowbar. Most of them, the names I would think were, a lot of the musicians were country musicians or a lot of emigrant musicians who would put names on them, like the Geese in the Bog, the Lark in the Morning, you know, sort of country names. Uh, Sean Shaquille, that's, that's the Irish word. It's, it's John and John and the Mist, or John and the Fog, the the, the Otter's Hole, or the wa Water Dog's Hole, you know. But such lovely names on them. I, I sometimes, you know, rather you hear the name for tune and you learn the tune. I find now too that when you learn two or three tunes, there'll be a whole lot drug off the other end. Thursday work too, you know. <laughs> the, the flutes are so, they're, they're very temperamental. You get very attached to a flute, you know, you get, you get very, very used to a flute. They, they maybe not, might be not quite in tune and one note, but you turn it slightly one way or the other to sharpen or flatten your, you know, while you're playing it. And you get very used to this and you, you're doing it with it without even practically noticing it. And only time you notice if you're playing a slow air, you might be noticing it more. Well. You have to be very careful with them. You you can't keep them in heat because they they could crack very easily, and you keep them well oiled with almond oil. But when when Sammy started to make flutes in Belfast here, and he came to Belfast and started to make the flutes, you were able to go to Sammy, you know, and he'd fix a crack for you, and then he started making flutes and they gradually got better and better. Well, you could just lift any one of Sammy's flutes. And it's just like playing your own flute, you know, they're just, they're great, you know. When I was working with the museum in Cultura, I got a bit of time off um, to research uh, woodwind instrument making, you know. So I started uh, initially to make um, copies of flutes for Baroque early classical music. And uh, my setup was a maker after leaving the museum. So I was making for, um, Export for early music shops in Italy and uh, Scandinavia, America, England. Um, but because of the there was a revive and interest in the flute, the traditional flute here, it wasn't long before the pressure was put on me to produce uh, flutes for traditional music. With the traditional musicians, they're not so much interested in whether the thing is historically accurate. They want it to work. 
uh, and there's a bit of freedom there in sort of, if you can call it, in design and the sound of the flute and the response, you know. I mean, this flute, for example, is, um, it's in the, the key of E flat, which is very popular for sessions, uh, traditional sessions. Now, I um, made this flute for Marcus Amora, who, uh, who's a, a Belfast player, but I knew his style. Uh, I mean, he plays um, very much influenced by the old uh, Leitrim Russ Common sort of Sligo music. Uh, and it had to be fairly punchy, you know, to give a fairly strong sound. But as well as that, I wanted a sort of a certain readiness. Um, and I had a few patterns for, for E flat flutes, but they, um, I wasn't really happy with any of them. So uh, it's a question, you take risks and you just juggle about with it, you know. And, I make so many different models of flutes that uh, you can take an idea of one and see if it works in another. This is one of Sam Murray's flutes. It's the E flat that he was speaking about. And as I told Leslie Bingham, a great friend of mine, told him once that playing one of Sam Murray's flutes, like going to your granny's house, it's, you can lift it up and do what you want and you feel at home with it. It's a, it's a, they're great instruments, great response, and Sam knew exactly what I want, like the lively style of music. Um, an interesting point that a few people would realise that a lot of tunes cross over uh, traditions. And places are very important. I do a lot of travelling. Just where I lived, I could hear tunes, we'll say, orange bands playing. If you take the structure of that, and the, one of the most famous reels recorded by traditional musicians, usually by fiddle players, is the swallow's tail. And the same structure, only with the C note added and speeded up into real time. If you listen to the, the march first, Same thing happens, I'll say, throughout County Antrim, County Down, County Derry, where there is a strong band tradition and a strong traditional musician uh, music tradition, where you have uh, lamb egg tunes, which are usually played in a fife, which is very shrill, and would maybe carry over a few town lands into the next village, maybe. In the Orange Band repertoire now, nowadays, for example, you're getting pop tunes and classical pieces, uh, TV programme themes, music hall stuff, all kinds of stuff that's been gathered up over the last hundred odd years or so, besides what you call orange tunes or party tunes. In the Fife repertoire, the most, the largest majority of the tunes seem to be based on the dance repertoire, i.e. reels and jigs and hornpipes, set dances and so forth. Um, a few of them come from the marching tradition, but the majority, as I say, are based on the dance tradition. As an example, like I play a wee bit, just a, a snatch of the two things. Um, there's a tune called uh, Young Men in Their Bloom, and I play it in fife and time, and then I'll go into jig time. Right, and it's just an ordinary double jig. Uh, Fife and time is hornpipe time, which is strange, because a hornpipe is a very strange time to walk to. As a man said to me, you have to, to kind of take a big long lap, he says it's more like a danda than a march, you know. I know I'm getting older, but I suppose a wee long, long ago, the lodges had nothing else but and long bags. The fife are usually plays a wee bit an introduction, providing the drummers as good drummers to the fife. And they started at the beginning of the gym. It's 
uh, there's stories told about the old boys if the drummer wasn't right on along with them at the end of the tune, he might have got cross and stuck the fife in his pocket. You have the flute developed uh, from the military fife, or Swiss pipe as they called it, because the Swiss mercenaries used them. Um, but that very simple form of a cylindrical bore, a uh, keyless instrument, six finger holes and an embouchure blow hole in it. Uh, I mean, that's still used here for the, uh, to accompany Lambeg drumming. Uh, if you could get uh, John Kennedy from Cullibag, he'd be a typical example of somebody who still plays that. I know, I mean, it's a tradition that's weakened, but uh, it's still there and, and alive to a certain extent. Okay. As well as having faith to the lamb bags in my lifetime. And then I got involved in us teaching for instructing, I would say, you know, to learn young youngsters to play the tan whistle or help them along that way. I'm greatly interested in that. Always, we always were interested in international music. Now, these youngsters that I got involved with, some of them not youngsters now, well, fortunately they're married, I suppose. That doesn't make me any <laughs> younger. There was a wee boy the other night there, played me a lovely tune, and he made a great job of it, you know, and he had been working at it. And uh, he says, you've been working very hard at that. He says, yes, I was. Well, I says, I know that. I says, what age are you? He says, I'm seven. Give me a great feeling of satisfaction. The flute bonds are coming back again. Uh, and there's plenty of youngsters quite capable of well, making up. Some are very good players, but they could be even better, you know. Music, you know, is something that I love from it. That's no a thing to be bonded about with. I think that when it's been done, like a wee bit of order. You have a funny thing happening with the the uh, the fife though, because you got the, the bands developing here. You know, on the on the sort of um, the orange side of the house here, uh, and they later went on to develop into sort of part music bands where they they started to use modern instruments. So you get really a strange twist there, where you have marching bands, part music bands, and then linking in again because of the type of flutes we're playing with modern orchestral music. Father, he started the band in 1917, he was conducted right up to the 60s. He was in the 39th Boys Brigade, and they had a band in the brigade. And then when it got 17, it was, he left the brigade. There was a crowd and thought they would start a old boys band for the camaraderie and that, you know. And that's how it started. We always had a, a sprinkling of good players, and then I think my father's attitude to playing and that helped to produce a, a good sound in the band, and that led to good playing. And then when the, the good players started coming along, I think probably Galway was the first that he began to feed back information that there was more to flute playing than what we knew about it. Like, it was no tradition of nobody in the band got taught. And our own band, we hoped that were creating a love for flute playing. My involvement with flutes and with flute bands is uh, attributable entirely to Billy Dunwood, who 
is my brother-in-law. My wife, who is a pianist of, of some excellence, also had developed this interest in the flute. Uh, so she took easily to the flute. And then the children came along. And then there was this visitor, Billy Dunwoody, <laughs> who figured again, you see. Uh, and once a youngster is able to walk, Billy hands him a flute. Our own youngsters were probably the first of the very young ones to be brought into the band. Uh, and there were one or two eyebrows raised because of this toddler, four years of age. She can't stretch the flute. Well, there's an answer to that. We'll give her a piccolo. She was bitten by the bug in due course when her arms got a bit longer. And with apologies to all piccolo players, she was promoted to the flute. <laughs> <laughs> then Paul uh, came along and just got caught up in the same thing. And so the, you know, we ended up, the two children and myself, on, on flutes. Uh, my wife performing a support role with the piano. a few families within the band and I think it's terrific that in the case of the little family for example both Carol and Paul uh, whom Billy and I uh, both taught um, they both have gone on to Manchester to study the flute The 39th isn't just a flute band uh, the 39th is a, a community and that community theme is important within the band. Perhaps in some respect, even more important than the music. And I think that has been uh, a force in attracting young people and in allowing young people, good flute players, to develop. Okay. Just before I went to college in Manchester, I studied with Billy Dunwoody, who is, I suppose you could say, the backbone of the 39th Old Boys Flute Ensemble. And Billy and I have been friends ever since, and when I came back to the Ulster Orchestra, I found myself conducting the 39th Old Boys Flute Ensemble, something which I enjoyed very much. The band had lots of talented children in there, um, Billy's daughter and granddaughter now play in the band, as do um, his niece, nephew. Right, from the double bar. One of the, the double current members of the 39th, um, who's probably very well known to most people through her BBC Young Musician appearances, is Jennifer Sturgeon. She's an extremely talented flute player. Right, beginning. Very beginning. was my teacher Colin Fleming who entered me for the BBC Young Musician of the Year and um, I only found out about it whenever I got the date of the audition. So um, my parents actually didn't want me to do the audition and they sort of rang him up and said um, we really would prefer it if she just, you know, we don't want any more pressure or anything. But um, Colin said well it's just really just for the experience 
just to see, let her see what the addition would be like. So parents thought that was great, so it would be a good experience for me. So I went down to the BBC. I remember that first, I was very nervous. I think I was sick actually in the ladies' toilets before I played. It was a bit of a shock getting through every round. I think I enjoyed the final more than the semi-final because the bully was in Manchester with me. I'd just finished an MIO course and I'd literally got off the train and stepped onto the platform. It was a big rush, but the final was more relaxed and I don't think I was really, I don't think I was nervous. I was nervous for the final. Many thirds, come on. Callie? Have you got one? I said you were finished, Gary. Finished. Right? Right, now who needs music, basis? Many. Where is your seat? Sit. Sit. Stella, can you be able to sit in here? Where's Helen? Yeah, Helen, you're all right there, you pair, right? I'm in fact, that's all right. <laughs> I suppose the most famous member of the 39th was James Galway, who any time he comes back to, to Belfast would always come along to a rehearsal and maybe spend some time with the members. Jesus, what's wrong? And in fact, he has actually played with the band in recent years. Here. <laughs> what a soul. Have you got a copy? Yeah, you're all right. You're all right. right. Certain, that's all right. That's okay. Let me switch. I'm going to play that. That's all right. Oh, God. What would that do? Try that there. What? That's his own missing. That's a quota there. That's all right. Is it the same key? Is that two sharps in the front? Great, come on, let's get started. Traditional music is not something I'm afraid I know very much about. I enjoy listening to it, and the flute players involved in it, I, I really admire. Some of them have the most amazing facility to, to get round the instrument, and really some of the things they do with it are, are quite phenomenal. I enjoy particularly listening to different styles of flute playing which I find extraordinary, that there's so many different styles within quite a small area. Well, here's a tune I'd like to play for you now, and it's a well-known tune in the tradition, a very much loved song. And I first heard it sung by Paddy Tunney, because the famous Pamana singer from Belique. And it's a song called The Mountain Streams Where the Moorcock Crows. So I'll play it for you now in a wee second.
But the first flute player that I ever heard was a man called John Joe McGuire. And uh, I was amazed, you know, at his playing. And I just thought it was great. And after that, I had to play the flute. There's a lot of different styles in, in flute playing. I, I met a great old friend, a man called Eddie Duffy. And Eddie had a sort of um, a different style of playing again to what I played. He had a sort of um, a kind of a wild style of playing. And I think a style that would have been influenced by the piping. It was a sort of a very, if you know, a very ornamented uh, type of style of playing. Very difficult to copy. I don't think there's anybody quite plays like Eddie. He was, a, he was a tall man, he was a big man, he had a large sort of a floppy sort of type of hand. And uh, of course there was no videos then to record his performance, so I had to sort of look at what he was doing. The technique in uh, playing the traditional flute, I suppose, differs from the uh, classical technique in that, in the, mainly in the method of articulation. Um, any tune will be, have a structure, a time signature built into it, which contains sufficient rhythm for the piece. But in practice, we add an awful lot of other things. We add little bits of ornamentation from above, we add it from below, we add ornamentation with breathing. Um, you happen to blow this thing like it's 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 a tough job. <laughs> it takes about three months to get on top of. Uh, you sort of you have dizzy head. You can have headaches. You can you're just gasping for air. But gradually you get used to it, and gradually you get into it. And um, once you get used to holding your neck up, once you get used to pins in your hands, you get used to what it's like. It's like a lot of uh, physical things. But unfortunately, with the flute, you have everything rolled into one. And um, while you're actually playing, of course, there's there's a part when you begin where you're. Even when you are practice playing, where you've, it's easy enough to, to begin to blow, but you don't blow with your best wind or anything. It's a bit like running. You run for a while, you get into your second wind, and then you're off and you can play all night, depending on how your other factors go. Students, do I think. Um, the first one was the Devil and Bailiff McGlinners, the second one was Kanye Canary Goods. Now, I think they're unusual tunes in that they, they have songs along with them, you know. You know, speaking of somebody who only plays occasionally, mm -hmm. when you come out, there's still some a definite style of playing developing in Belfast, yeah. in that you have to, you know, it's a hard hitting, it's the sort of, I think it's the mm -hmm. the Russ Common sort of right. Uh, right. Lego type of thing, where it's a hard, punchy sort of style. Because oh, I find I have to keep pushing, yeah, and pushing, you know, to yeah. keep the volume up and the, the beat up, you know, mm -hmm. along with it. So although I mean, there's a lot of different influences. I think mm -hmm. throughout the town, you're there's doing it in something developing. Yeah, that sort you know, of style. Yeah. That could almost be though that the, usually the place you're playing are so noisy, people shouting it. You have to that's blow the living daylights out of it to be able to hear what you're at. That's, that's part of it too. It is, and it's, I have to say that's a pretty unpleasant part of it. I think it might force people to play too loud and play out of tune. And, well, still, what can you do? You know all those kids that play up around South Derry and Port Cologne and so on? In the sense They all that come from that. There was no native. There was a fife in tradition, which is a sort of military yeah. uh, band tradition, really. Uh, but there was no concert flute tradition well, as a, such. Well, it isn't exactly a fife, but it's along, along the lines of the fife. Yeah, yeah, just it's a heavily good one, I am. <laughs> when we're talking about life, <laughs> but, uh, the whole tradition of flute playing can't really... The style, the sort of technique that we use when we're talking about technique, and forgetting about regional styles and personal styles. Yeah. There is a sort of general technique that has an awful lot in common with the technique used in the island pipes and the bagpipes, the Scottish, the Highland bagpipes. And there's similarities like that, like I would say that role, the basic role. And that's common to piping, both island piping and bagpiping. Well, there's, another, there's another point uh, too that's always well considered. 
the instrument itself tells you how it must to be played. Of course. You know. Right, here we go. The tradition of music and is really a thing to bring people together. And it's a very important thing that people should realise that it is something which knits a community together. And of course, traditional musicians don't really give a care what background a person has, whether they're rich or poor, whether they're from one side of a street or another side of the street. They can all join together and play traditional music, which is what it's all about. If you look across the north of Ireland, you find that last in any any marching season there'll be somewhere in the region of two thousand parades. And most of these parades will be not associated with the Orange Orders or indeed any of the other uh, loyal orders. They are parades organised by the bands themselves for their own amusement, um, for their own competition purposes. I think for Victorians, flute playing was a kind of a craze, so I suppose uh, like a fever. There was even a walking stick flute. Um, to the extent that I suppose the, it naturally, I suppose the instrument had to spill over into other forms of music. And like here we are today, it's quite still quite popular in Irish music, very popular. Why it's popular, I don't know, because it's an awful hard thing to learn to, to get on top of playing. I'll go on playing the flute uh, as long as I can, but the old teeth are doing the best now, and they say when you lose those, you know, I'll be back in the tin whistle again, you know. As long as I can play it, I'll play it, that's it, you know. Get, get comfort and crack out of it, you know. I've made more friends through it. Not only in this country, from like everywhere, you know, I've made so many friends there. 